my name is Michael Serkin. Um, I work at Rutgers and I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about temporizing external fixation, primarily of the uh, foot and ankle as well as the knee. So how many people work ab uh, above the, at the knee level? Is anyone, any foot? So most people are foot and ankle surgeons? Okay. So I'll, I'll go through the pin. I have some stuff on plateau, but I'll go through it fairly quick, okay? So why do temporizing uh, external fixation, you probably all know, especially for the pilon, um, you know, it's, it's, we want to base it on the personality of the fracture. And so external fixation, the concepts initially are to avoid burning any bridges. And so you see here, this is the last thing you want to do. If you can uh, see right here, these pins are in the zone of injury and you want to stay out of the zone of injury. This pin is probably also in the knee joint okay because it's kind of close here might be out of it so you want to stay away from those areas so why because you're going to put plates in maybe later internal fixation for if you're going to convert some of your pilons or your plateaus um, you can always add extra pins later if you decide to go to a definitive fixator but we want to temporize things uh, to protect the soft tissue Minimize complications, keep your pins out of the joints. As I said, I've seen a couple times where people put them into the ankle joint or put them into the knee joint, uh, not on purpose, but now you get septic arthritis and you haven't done anything beneficial for the patient because you were trying to temporize the soft tissue anyway and not cause problems and now you have another uh, problem. So in the, around the knee, we wanna be above the super patellar pouch and put your pins in the safe zone. Why else is it good to do temporizing against the planned surgery? So, you know, this comes in on night one. You know, you want to have time to think about it. Somebody said thinking about your case on the way home driving. I think it's important to reflect on everything you do or everything you're going to do. I have some of my most brilliant moments, at least I think they are, at 2 o'clock in the morning when I wake up and I go, aha. You know, and so I think that's key. You should do that. I think walking out of the OR, high-fiving yourself, that's the wrong mentality. You should be going, what could I do better? It's very rare I fare really good about myself when I leave the OR. Um, get a CAT scan on some of these. You can decide where you go open or closed, where you're going to do percutaneous, right equipment, better personnel. And if you have to transfer the patient, put an X fix on and now the patient's stabilized and now somebody else maybe get it into someone else's hands who's better. So if you know how to put a safe fixator on, you can do patients a lot of good. This is a typical Newark tattoo. Um, Fuck the police. Well, that's what it says. Yeah, it's a picture of the guy's brother who was supposedly shot by the police. I'm sure he was minding his own business walking around the streets of Newark. But anyway, so here, first on spanning knee frames, uh, this is the typical look of a leg that has a bad plateau. You could see blistering. You don't want to be operating through this. This is how I put on my spanning knee frame, and I'll talk a little bit about it just in case. Because you might, you know, somebody said, it, you know, it's about thinking about what you can do. And I like X-Fix too, is like we all had Erector sets when we were kids, uh, if they're still out there or Legos, you know, and you know, you got to play and think. And that's what I do with this. And so when I was first handed to me, I said, what can I do differently with this external fixer that I can't do with the current ones? Well, the one thing is, is I can distract uh, through something. And so I put this frame on a plateau. This bar goes on last. These two go on first. And what I could do now is if I don't have my length right for my plateau, it's very easy as long as you pay attention when you put it on to connect this clamp to this part, the red part, and then you can distract just by turning. So now I can distract just the plateau and now I can get my length. And so that's something I couldn't do before. If I was using a different fixer, I'd have to pull and you know, you couldn't, add a little bit or you could put on the distractor compressor you put it on and then you take it off in some other companies well here I had something that was built in and that and that now I could control distraction the set but you know it became a little bit of a problem at first uh, because of the uh, metal and it's hard to see and I'll show you so we have now have carbon fiber bars as well and so I just if this is a plateau fracture all the metal is above the plateau. So here's the knee joint. I put a line there so that if I get an x-ray, I can see it and the metal is all above it. So we're good to go. And so just pay attention to where you're putting your metal if you're going to have to uh, image things later for temporizing measures. So two pins crossing, uh, you, you know, I look at frames around the knee as two types. You either have a plateau fracture or you have a distal femur fracture. 
and all we're doing is moving the same frame. So if it's a distal femur, I put two pins in the proximal tibia and two pins in the proximal femur. And so I'm out of the way. And all I have to do if it's a plateau is just do this, and it's two pins in the distal tibia and two pins in the distal femur. So here you can see the plateau. We had a, obviously a femur fracture with it, but we can distract. You don't see any pins here. Why? That's where I'm going to put plates in if I'm not going to treat this with a hybrid. If I want to treat this with a hybrid, I can do that too. And I can come back and always add the wires and the pins when I have time to think about the fracture and think about what I want to do. And so I haven't burned any bridges. I can always do something later. So here you go, same frame. The other thing that is a, a little unique and it's really helpful for me is this clamp. Um, and this clamp is a clamp that you know, it has two ball joints on it. And so a lot of times around the knee, especially if you only go at one bar and one bar, unless your pins are perfect, okay, you can get translation if you don't have enough degrees of freedom and you go, why isn't this thing reducing? It'll look okay when you X fixed it, but all of a sudden you go to re repair the whole thing and do your reconstruction and things won't get together. Because, and it's usually because, you know, you release the clamp and then you see how far apart those two bars actually were you know, now that I got the thing aligned. But this clamp has now allowed me to be able to, because you can go about 50 degrees on each of these. And so that it, you, once you tighten that up, it's tight, but it also gives you the angulation that you need to really get good alignment, okay? And so the way I do it is, is I will, again, I'll put this on, this on, and I'll do my reduction and I'll just pull, tighten it down, check my x-ray, if I have to distract, I can distract, and then I just add this bar at the end. And really this bar, if you look at external fixation, and um, if you look at external fixation and what the weakest link is, the weakest link early is always the components, the pin-to-bar connectors or the clamps. And so this will protect this clamp. That's all it's really doing. Okay, and in thin patients, I don't even bother with it, but in heavier patients, I'll typically put on that bar and I just put it on and I get it to, to the two pins. So the other thing that's nice is you can use it as a femoral distractor for when you're doing plateaus or pylons. You already have a frame on, you just grab the bar and I don't have to take out the femoral distractor. And you can see here, um, will this play? Yeah, so now I can distract across my plateau, and so I can get a visualization to look into the plateau, or if you have it on for a pylon, you could do it as well. And you can see here, you can see the joint distract right there where I need to see. Okay, and I use that a lot. Intra-op, I just take the bar and I move it to where I need it, because I already have a piece of, of metal. I already have it on the field. Or on a pylon, same thing, I can just use the pins that have previously been placed to distract. Okay, and here's that case. And the other thing you can do, somebody said it's, it's only what you can do imaginatively and, and, and use. Well, if you see here, I had a spanning frame on this patient's distal femur fracture, and I now have put an extra pin in here to reduce things, an extra pin in the femoral condyle. So I'm using the frame to manipulate and hold so that I can then put this distal femoral plate in that you see right here going in. These are some wires going in and I'm plating a sawbone now. Makes it much easier. You let the fixer do the work, okay? I have lots of residents. I'd still let the residents do the work. You can see back here is probably the femur, ex fem excuse me, the femur fracture we're treating, okay? And here you can see just a little close up. So this, you know, you know this is a distal femur fracture because look where, the, look where I put the metal bar. The metal bar is here so that I can distract the distal femur. So this is that frame reverse, the two pins in the proximal tibia, two pins in the proximal femur to be able to distract. And I really like the ability to do that. And I, even after I like get my reduction, I always just do a couple more turns to kind of put a little tension on the soft tissue because this way when I go back in, the soft tissue will be more pliable when I let the real length come down, okay? Same thing in a, in a, in a um, pylon. So let's talk more about spanning ankle frames. Um, these are your indications. I, you know, I'd rather kill myself honestly than have to operate on charcoal like all of you. But I do like uh, infections in the tibia and elsewhere, and I do do a lot of pylon fractures and stuff. So uh, this is where we're going to do it. I'll talk to you about this frame and why I use this frame. 
just this is how it goes on. You can see I have one pin, two pins, and then a transfixation calcaneal pin. And the way this goes on is <clears throat> I connect this pin to the calcaneal pin and without attaching this pin to begin with, I do my provisional reduction, lock it all up, see what has to be altered, and then I add this. And what does this do? Well, this pin here can control your sagittal plane by pushing up and down on this pin, and I have some other pictures of it I'll show you, and I just want to go over it a couple times. So by pushing up and down, you loosen here, and by pushing up and down on that pin, you can now translate the tibia anteriorly or posteriorly, depending on what it needs for that case. Typically, you want to be pushing it posteriorly with an ankle or a pilon. Why? What does everyone do? They go and they put their foot up. The tibia subluxates anteriorly because they have a pillow under their leg, because what did we tell them to do? Go home and elevate your leg. And then their tibia subluxates anteriorly and they come to your office. Yeah, we're going to fix your pilon, except there's a black dot right where you want to make an incision if you're going to plate it. Okay? So I test all my frames and I tension them by pushing down and then tightening. And I test all my frames by putting a bump in the OR under the leg and get an x-ray and make sure that that ankle is not subluxating at all in the operating room because I'd rather know in the operating room if I have to stiffen my frame than when they come to me with a black dot on their ankle, okay? The other thing, and I'll go over this, is this is now. Somebody handed me this frame and said, what can I do differently? Well, it dawned on me that, whoops, whoa. That's it. Well, let's just see. It dawned on me, sorry about that. It dawned on me that now I have controlled distraction and controlled compression, right? So I got to think about it. Sometimes you'll get that x-ray and your talus won't be centered under your tibia. It'll be translated typically a little lateral, right? Because the, the talus follows the fibula, okay? And the fibula is usually translated laterally, okay? And so I can now control pushing this this way or pulling it depending on what we do. And I have pictures and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so there it is again. If you want to put a foot pin in, you can attach a foot pin if you need to. to somebody said you can attach anything wherever you want. It's only limited by, like you said, by what you want. Calcaneal pin safe zone is right there. Okay, so here's a distal tibia, a little bit of an intraarticular medial malleolus. Okay, now I put this frame up because this was before I had my carbon fiber, and I go, well, and again, I was trying things at this point. Well, I was trying to do the controlled distraction, right? So I told you I connect everything to here first and then here, not here. So the way this construct is, is I could dial out distraction of my ankle joint if I needed to. But what's the problem? Can't see anything. <laughs> so sometimes it's okay. I mean, if, you're not, if your reduction's not important, uh, you know, you can see it if you go off axis. But I wanted carbon fiber because it would help me more when I'm doing pilon and fracture work. Sometimes I do use this construct when I don't have to see the joint because you have this built-in distraction, okay? Here was an open tibia with a, well, this part was open with an intraarticular component. Here we were able to work through the open fracture component. Here's the standard frame that I put on, as I said, okay? temporizing and then I can come back and do an anterior lateral plate later when the soft tissue has calmed down around the ankle. So this is a distal, mostly extra articular tibia. Here's the frame. So you take a look at this and what do we notice? It's not bad. It's not badly aligned, but we're not quite perfect, right? I'd rather translate the talus medially to get this. So what can you do? So this is where I was talking about things. So Here's our little knob that we can turn to distract. And here is where it's going to distract. But if you just do that, all you'll do is spread the bars, right? Because the foot can't move. So you want the foot to be able to slide medially. And so you have to loosen the connection to the pin down here. So as you dial that out, this moves this way. 
okay? It allows it to slide on that pin because you're pulling this pin medial. And that allows you to shift everything to where you want it to shift. Okay, here's a close-up. You're going to turn here. You're going to get distraction here. Now, if you don't want to figure out which way to go, just put them all on a little distracted because you don't know if they're going to be medial or lateral. And this way you could either compress or distract and you could decide if you have to move it medial or lateral and just loosen the appropriate calcaneal side depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Again, it's all what you can think about doing. And we do it, and I've done it elsewhere too. But that's the beauty of... The, so why, why do I use SEAL now? And this is the reason I use SEAL because it allows me to do certain things that I can't do with another fixator as easily. You can do it all. You can use compression distractors and take them off and put them back on if they find them, etc. But you have the built-in components to do this. Okay, and as I said, you can move. And here you can see what I can do just by dialing this in. And then, it, then it's, you know, there you go. Then it's like plating a sawbone now if you want to put a plate on it or if you want to come back and put a hybrid on. You haven't burned any bridges. Again, don't burn bridges. Come back and put wires through the distal fragment. It, you're good to go. I love your lecture. I got one question for you for someone that does a lot of circular frames and very few of these types of uh, fixations. With what we see with this speed frame, what we've shown with the speed frame, we can fixate all the same areas you're fixating with the speed frame. Would you ever consider just saying, if a gradual correction or for immediate correction in all three planes, it's just going with the speed frame construct? And if no, why would you? You could do a speed frame, but I'm a plater now, okay? I tend to plate most of these. I also am typically doing these, um, it, you, you know, a speed frame for me is a little bit more fiddle factor, only because you have to play a little bit to get your pins on your rings, okay? But certainly it's not that much more of a fiddle factor. And if you're going to use definitive fixation, as definitive fixation, it's a great way to go, especially now if you want to add another pin to get closer to your fracture to increase stability because you can just drop it off of any of the rods. So there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I did a lot of them for a long time. I just prefer to plate them because of who, where I practice and, you know, I get a lot of phone calls from the patients and if I can eliminate some of those, um, some of the thin wire stuff, you know, I'd say I'd rather put the wires in my eyes than in patients. <laughs> Which, uh, which anterior, which anterior medial plate do you like on the chair? Do you which, not to talk about the companies, so which one do you like? Is that? That was anterior plate? lateral. Right, which, which plating system would you like? I okay. switched between Zimmer and uh, Synthes. Okay. So, I put this up because you think at first glance that this looks pretty good, but keep in mind that this is probably translated following the posterior mal fragment, right? And so this is where that sagittal plane comes in, where I want to push the tibia back. You know, what happened to it? So you can push. This is where I was talking about. You use that pin, you loosen, and now you can move the tibia front and back. And now it's better centered, and I'm happier with this. Is this terrible? No. But this is better, and you can see the joint over-distracted. Similar type of a thing. This be careful of. Okay? People send this out all the time. I don't have the CAT scan, but if you get a CAT scan of that, that is sitting, the talus is sitting right on a very sharp point, and I put a frame on this and come back and do his trimal later. Okay? There you see it in the frame. Looks better, right? That's what you want to see. Okay? So real quick, soft tissue frame. So someone talked about this. I don't do the soft tissue work, plastics does. There we go. So I'll just put a speed frame on with, well, okay. Sorry guys, gals. So, you know, this patient needed a flap and, they, and two, there's two functions here. Uh, he had a calcaneus fracture, I think, but it wasn't a tibia fracture. But I put this frame, our plastics guys, want to keep the foot off of the bed. And so I just put two pins in and I put a speed frame on. I put it on this way on purpose because this way their foot is stable and can't rock in their bed and now it stays. 
They also didn't want ankle motion in this, so I have a foot pin in here to stop the ankle motion so that we don't have movement across the flap, okay? Um, I had done, this was the first time I did it. God, this, you know, and then I go, what am I doing? He had already had a delta frame on, which is why he got this. And then I said, it's easier just to do this. This takes, what, five minutes. Two, two tibial pins, and you walk out, and they go, wow, that, you know, it's helpful for the plastics guys. This was the same thing. This had a delta frame on already. And you can see here, they want to keep the heel off the bed and elevated. He also had an Aquinas contracture, and this was longstanding, uh, referred to the plastics guys. So I put this frame on, and you see what I did is I distracted the bars before I put them on so I could pull the foot up out of Aquinas. And here you could put them both on, right? Pilon and plateau. Uh, let's just move on. We can talk about some of this. Get your alignment. Check your x-rays. You know, this looks great until you look here, which is where the talus belongs, not where it is. Um, so keep an eye on that. Look at your fibula. That can't be out to length, right? That's not. It's short, even though the mortise looks fine. You know, again, the mortise looks good here belongs down there, <laughs> okay? Uh, these are all the things that have to do with stiffening a frame. If your frame's not stiff enough, I think you know all this. The number one thing is pin diameter. And you know, keep in mind, just going from a four to five is huge, and five to six is not as much, but it's still pretty good. And so you know all that stuff. Uh, double stacking doesn't add that much, except in the frontal plane, okay? Multiple plane frames. You know, you can do this with a pin bar frame. This is no different than an Elizarov, et cetera, right? Pins are stiffer in the, frames are stiffer in the plane of the pin. Okay, osteopenia. There's your summary.